Welcome to the Braving Business Podcast. I'm your host, Tal Zlotnitsky. Today, I am not joined by my co-host and executive producer, PJ Benoit. He's traveling, but I am joined by a wonderful guest. James Henderson has a passion for efficiency and process optimization, and he also has a prestigious Top 40 Under 40 award under his belt. He has over 20 years experience overseeing both domestic and international business strategies in a variety of industries, including security, IT, and technology. James was previously the president and COO of publicly traded firm Avigilon, which he led up to and through a $1 billion acquisition, proving that you don't have to be Ivy League to make it. He is now the founder and CEO of MindZ, and I am delighted to have him here. James, it's an honor to have you on the Braving Business Podcast. Tal, thanks for having me. That's my pleasure. So, James, you have a, a fascinating story. I, I uh, usually, just for the benefit of our guests, we have a a, a pretty comprehensive uh, pre questionnaire, and uh, I was fascinated with uh, how you represented yourself, which is very humbly. And my first question to you is: For someone with the track record that you've had, uh, not a lot of people can say that they've led a company to a billion dollar transaction. Uh, you repeatedly mentioned, you know, you started off as a mediocre student at community college. Um, I'd love to hear about you know, the transformation or realization that propelled you to success? What was it that gave you the faith that you could do more than maybe some other people believed you could? Yeah, no, it's a, it's an interesting question. And yeah, to be fair, I, I don't think I was ever the brightest person in the room. Um, I did go to a community college. I'd say my grades were, I didn't fail, but nothing staggering. Um, you know, I think there are two things that really propelled me. So one was simply a drive to say, I want to do better. Um, I grew up fairly humble beginnings. Um, my family was not wealthy, frankly, you know, bordering on the poverty line. And I knew that that's not how I wanted to spend the rest of my life. Even before I went to college, I actually had to work construction for several years to save up to pay to go. Um, so I got started a little bit late in life, but really knew that I wanted to get out of the position that I was in. And I don't think that's neither here nor there, honestly, for most individuals, because it really doesn't matter where you start, but that was just part of mine. I'd say the more important thing was really around uh, a innate drive to do things properly the first time. Um, so how do you, how do you all, define properly? What is, what is properly? Uh, I, and then properly is, that's a good question, Tal. Properly is probably not the most appropriate term. Um, it's probably more to the best of your ability. Um, and it was just anything I was going to do, whether it was knocking down a wall or redoing flooring and construction um, or anything else in life, I wasn't going to go at a half measure. I was going to do it the best that I could. Now, that didn't mean that it was better than anybody else. Um, that didn't mean that it was the best in the world. But it meant that I was going to give it everything that I had to do whatever job was in front of me properly. And what that meant was as I carried that through my career, um, that sense of putting in effort and pride in what you do, I think really had a significant driving factor in terms of me achieving where I was today. You know, it's and I don't want to ramble on too much, but an interesting story. One of my first real jobs out of college Um uh, was with a smaller organization. And, you know, in smaller organizations, you wear a multitude of different hats, as you know, Tal. Um, and in wearing all those multitude of hats, one of them was just keeping everything running. And I was a young man. Uh, I was out with some friends on a Saturday. And for some reason, I wanted to show one of my friends Saturday night what I was doing now. So I was going to pull up the website. And the website wasn't working. Now, the instant reaction is, ah, that's a Monday problem. My reaction was, well, I represent this company and that's not the way that we should be represented. I actually left where I was, drove into the office, logged in, sat there on Google and tried to figure out and solve what the problem was with the website and got it back up and running that night. Just because that was important to me that if I knew that there was a problem out there that I put in the care and attention it needed to try and resolve it. So it, it's really that combination of, and I would say it's not so much my mediocre upbringings, although it had a massive impact on me. It's more of just an inherent desire to do the best I could with whatever task was in front of me and to never leave it and just say, that's somebody else's problem. That's that's super interesting. And I, I 
concur that you know a lot of doing well is about being committed to doing the right things and staying with them. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. My, my brother was, uh, my business partner for many years and, and he was our chief product officer. Um, uh, also for a while, our, our co-CEO. And I remember him telling me that, you know, there was no time where he was more anxious than during a live demonstration to a client. Doesn't matter how prepared you think you are, or how well you've tested the software, something can always go wrong. And he said, you know, if you had a blood pressure cuff on me, when we did live demos, I'm sure my blood pressure was 150 over 120. So uh, yeah, I can I can relate to, to having that. And and I, we've all had the experience where you you know yeah, exactly the one you described. You're 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 running something you expect a certain outcome, and you don't get what you're expecting. So let, let me delve back. Let me let me actually, if you don't mind, go backwards and talk about that upbringing. Um, what do you think you took away from? I mean, you know, as someone that grew up, um, sounds like working class. Um, what were your biggest takeaways? What did you learn from your parents or what did you learn from your environment about success, uh, opportunity? Uh, you know, and it, it's interesting. I'd say my my goal in life when I decided that I needed to get out was I wanted to be a guy who wore a suit to work, which is a, a silly goal. But as a young man, I thought that that had meant that I had a, a decent paying job and I had somewhat made it. Um. You know, and and for me, Tal, I'll take it in a slightly different direction. You know, as we talked about before, mediocre grades in a mediocre community college. Um, I was not a star athlete. Uh, I was never really the best at anything that I did. And I'll be the first to admit it. But the one thing that I can tell people is that I was not going to be outworked. I knew that, especially when it came to business uh, and doing things that need to be done, I was never going to be the one that was the anchor, the person who wasn't rowing in the boat. I was going to row faster, harder, take on more than anybody else. And, you know, I, I don't know if that's a factor of my upbringing or just a, my, my general personality. But that is what I took away from it. There was a, never going to be a time where anybody pointed at me and said, he's slacking off. And I carried that in in everything, not just business, but also construction. And, you know, honestly, Tal, maybe part of it was the fact that I was never that good in school. I was never a rock star in sports. I played sports, but I was never the greatest. So I sunk my teeth into business and said, maybe this is the thing, if I give it 120%, that I could be really good at. You know, I, I find it interesting and I'm, you know, I'm a first generation American. I came here as an undocumented immigrant at the age of 12 and I've always had a chip on my shoulder. I've always felt like I needed to work harder. I needed to outwork everyone. I needed to show more. Uh, and I know that, you know, uh, a lot of friends of mine uh, that uh, either are also immigrants or people of color or people that came from socioeconomic backgrounds that were uh, disadvantaged oftentimes talk about what you just talked about. They, they, they feel like they have to outwork the, the Ivy Leaguers and everyone else that maybe never really had to struggle. Uh, do you think that's ultimately an advantage? I mean, having that experience, that mindset, did, did it make you uniquely qualified to deal with adversity? You know, it, I would I would not use the term advantage, Tal, because if I had to rewind and do it again, I think we'd both probably I like the opportunity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or, or disadvantage. I, you know, yeah. the, the reality, I do yeah. think it makes you disadvantaged um, because an it'd be nice to have an easier path. Imagine an easier path with that same mentality and what you could achieve. But the reality is we didn't have it. And I think to a certain degree, it does shape you um, into being that person who is, and, and I think drawn to success, but also I think success comes from what you are doing, right? Because of that mindset to achieve and to over deliver, um, it is almost inevitable that you get to accomplish greater things that doesn't necessarily mean you end up being elon musk or uh, but but it means that you can accomplish things in life yeah i i can relate um you know let's talk about setbacks um you know you started your business career even when you outwork uh everyone else even when you're you know willing to put in 120 percent. and to be honest with you i don't think there's such a thing 
I think a hundred percent is plenty. If you can put it in every day, you're, you're doing well more than most people who uh, are satisfied putting in 50, 60, 70%. And by the way, there are some days where 50 or 60 or 70% is all you can do. It's not about doing a hundred percent necessarily every day. Gonna, there are going to be days where maybe you are doing the equivalent of 150% and other days where it's 50, but consistently giving it your best as I think what you're talking about. Talk to me about setbacks and, and, and whether um, or how you process those setbacks to prevent yourself from sliding backwards uh, in terms of your self-belief, right? So a lot of our uh, conversations are occurring inside our heads, right? Self-talk. Um, as things were not necessarily going your way, and maybe you can even come up with an example of a uh, time like that in your career, what did you do to keep yourself from saying, well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, of course, I'm not doing that well. I was a mediocre student and not a great athlete, and I had no advantages. So, of course, I'm struggling. What did you do so that that didn't become your mindset? You know, it's, it, I'll, I'll probably use an example from the business I'm in now, Mindset, because I've, I've launched this new company, and it's, uh, uh, it is fraught with challenges when you launch a startup. They are inevitable. And in, in fact, they are never ending is probably a more appropriate term. You're going to continue to have them. Um, and they can be soul sucking for lack of a better term. You know, it's, um, we launched this new business and I'll, I'll use it because most relevant and six months in, we had the idea, we had our first product ready to go. Things are great. Um, we got into a partnership with one of the four largest consulting firms in the globe. And I shouldn't say gone to a partnership, a partnership discussion with them. They want to take our product to market. They think it's perfect for what they're doing. Um, so we go down the path, right? We get some paperwork in place. They submit it up the chain. All of a sudden it gets torpedoed. Stopped on a dime. You're six months in, the whole team is elated. We're going to get this massive partnership right out of the gate. It's going to propel us to be Facebook type success. Uh, and the rug gets pulled out from under us. That is, even for the person that needs to be the company's biggest cheerleader, right, being the CEO, that is gut-wrenching, right? It, it just sucks the life right out of you. Um, the biggest thing for me, and if you ever do your homework on it, is I'm, I'm not some type of fitness junkie, but I, I like to keep active. And the transformational aspect of getting outside or any type of exercise is incredible. So when I have these, these major defeats, and we all get them, it's inevitable in life. Um, I like to take a few minutes and do a reset. Get outside, go for a walk for an hour. If you're a runner, go for a run. If you like going to the gym, great time to go to the gym. If you like biking, go biking, right? If you like to hike, go hiking. Whatever you're doing, take half an hour, an hour out of your day and go reset your own mind. Get those endorphins pumping and it, it allows you to come back, shake it off and get back at it with a veracity. Because if not, if you're sitting in the same chair, doing the same thing for the next eight hours, you're stewing on it. And it is without shaking it off, it is a massive anchor that you're trying to drag forward. And you need to just break it off. And I think for a lot of, I would say, even startups, probably more so, but even anyone in business, they don't take that time. They're too busy. I don't have 20, 30 minutes. I don't have 45 minutes in the middle of my day. But what they miss is the massive value that it brings to their own mental state in taking those few minutes and how that allows them to, all right, cut it off. Let's shake it off and let's get on to the next thing. Yeah, I think it's fabulous advice. And, uh, you know, there have been times in my career where the only thing that kept me sane was stepping away because things were really tough. And uh, when things are really tough, what happened to me uh, before I became a little bit better at self-awareness and self-management um, was that I would obsess. And my mind would just obsess over whatever uh, I was dealing with. A lot of times it would, it would, it would almost be like a Rub Rub Rubik's Rubik's cube. I don't know how to say, I forget how to say it, but just turning it from every direction, trying to see, is there an angle I hadn't thought of? And in truth, there's diminishing returns in that. I mean, at some point, if you don't give your mind the chance to quiet down, 
um, you're actually going to most likely make more mistakes and get into a, a more difficult position, or you may offend, you may uh, not be mindful enough to, to pay attention to your human connections, uh, whether it's at home or at work, uh, and cause yourself more harm. Um, tell me, talk to me about self-talk. I mean, when you talk to yourself, uh, how hard are you on yourself? How, how capable are you of being gentle with yourself when you, you make a mistake or things don't go your way? You know, I, I would say I, I tend not to be overly hard on myself. <laughs> I don't know, again, Tal, if you go to my upbringings, I was never the best at anything. So it's not like I had these expectations that you're going to be number one, right? And why aren't you number one? I was never one, number one. So it was never really my point of, um, my point of being able to find myself was the fact that I had to be perfect and had to be the best. Um, it was more of, I have to move forward right? You have to keep working. You have to keep going at it and you have to look for the little wins, right? So I never held up the big trophy. Um, so I think it, it put me in a mental state where I was more able to deal with failure um, because it's, it's kind of what I've experienced my entire life to get to where I am today, right? And I think failure to a certain degree is inevitable. I think a lot of the people that I see that really have a hard time with it um, are probably because throughout their life, maybe they didn't experience enough failure, right? So if this is the first time that you're getting told that, you know, you're not good enough, what you built is not valuable enough, right? You're on the wrong path. Uh, it can be devastating for someone who hasn't dealt with a lot of failure in the past, I think. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. As, as, I'm, as I'm hearing you talk about that, one thing that comes to mind for me is the kind of parenting a lot of people do. I, I'm, I have three adult children, um, and uh, my ex-wife and I uh, did not believe in coddling them too much. We wanted them to experience life. We wanted them to experience setbacks and also learn to self-advocate. Advocate. advocate. Um, I don't know if you have any children, but how do you practice this? You know, how do you practice this in 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 your life? And what advice would you give our our listeners about building resilient children? Yeah, I'd say this is a, a dangerous topic, <laughs> you know, trying to teach people how to parent or tell them what the best way to parent is. I have no idea. You know, I have two children, but I, you know, um, I am not an expert at it. I don't know if there's such thing as being an expert at it, to be honest. I approach the matter the same way that my life taught me, which is I expect you to work hard. I don't care if you score the most goals. I don't care if you never score a goal. I don't care if you have 100% or you got 80%, but I want you to give it your all. And anything you do, if you give it your all, then you should walk away proud. Don't walk away thinking that you have to be the smartest or the best person. Walk away competing with yourself and not others. And I think that's, that's the best advice that I try and give to my children and the same approach that I kind of take in life, you know, and am I going to be Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk? No. And that's fine. They are incredible people and they've set their path. Well, how many but people I'm are, a, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> there, but there's I'm only two of them myself. or a handful of them. Right? Yeah. I'm going to challenge myself to be the best that I can be. And that's where I'm going to take joy. And that's where I'm going to set my bar. And, and that also, I think, Tal, to a certain degree, um, puts it as an attainable bar. You know, if you think of sports, you know, if your kid's not going to be six, seven, 300 pounds, maybe they're not going to play in the NFL. So setting that as your North star, maybe is not an attainable goal for them, but teaching them that, listen, be the best player you can be out in the football field or out in the basketball court, the whatever teammate. it is, or the best teammate, but be the best that you can be in your role. Um, I think is a much more attainable goal. And to a certain degree, I always believe challenging but achievable right you need to challenge yourself but if you're challenging yourself to goals that are unattainable um you're setting yourself up just to be disheartened at every single step talk to me about how you think your leadership style um is impacted by your life experience how do you lead differently than you know the guy that or gal who maybe grew up um with more advantages than you do you think that impacts how you lead without a doubt um I tend to lead by, I'll be the first first one in, whatever it is. If I need to sweep the floor, I'll be the first one to show up and sweep the floor. doesn't matter what it is. Um, but at the same time, I, I'm, I also don't 
I'm not a tyrant, right? And what I mean by that, I, I don't believe in the kiss the ring culture. I don't think that sets a culture of productivity when you need to bow down to me because I have some title or some innate ability. It doesn't make me smarter or better than anybody else. So um, I'd say those two things, but also third is unfortunately, you know, probably on the more negative side, I have high expectations of people, super high expectations because I am willing to put in, you know, that hundred percent. I expect everyone else to give a hundred percent to eat, sleep and breathe it. And over the course of my career, I've learned to also try and tamper some of those expectations because that's not going to be real for everybody. Right. And although so you have, want everybody two, to I, go, go ahead, ahead, sorry, finish your thought. I have a couple of questions for you, but go ahead and finish the thought. Yeah, I was going to say, although you want everybody to be like, this is life or death in the organization, I'm going to give you everything that I have, including my firstborn to make it successful. You can find some of those people, but it's not real to fill hundreds of positions with people. And you can find some really good people to your point that, you know, it's a career for them, but it's not life defining. Um, and you need to be able to understand how a person is and what motivates them and not expect that everybody else um, necessarily treats it as a life or death situation. Yeah. You know, um, and I think I, I, I find a lot that I agree with in what you just said and a lot that I can relate to. And uh, it was about 20 years into my career and I've now been in business since I was 19. So I'll be 50 this year. So it's been a while, 20 plus years into my career when a good friend uh, who was my head of HR pulled me aside and said, I want you to understand something. The fact that you're here so early and that you stay so late puts a lot of pressure on people because they feel like since you're here, they also have to be here. So you talked about being the first, which is, by the way, a very common mindset for people like you and I, who basically fought our way and persevered our way and just hard worked our way into positions of power and influence. How much thought do you give to the fact that, you know, you showing up a certain way is going to impact people in ways that maybe are not intentional for you? Yeah, you know, I, I unfortunately, I've heard the same thing, Cal, um, mm -hmm. right? Being the one that turns the lights out every night can put unintentional pressure on the rest of your employees. Um, but part of it is the unfortunate reality is I'm not going to apologize for my work ethic and I don't want to sound bad, but I think you also need to help employees understand you're not judging them for the amount of hours they put in, right? I'm there for 12, 14 hours a day because my pile is this big and I just can't get it whittled down without putting in those type of hours, but you're judging them on performance, not hours. I don't care if you're there for eight hours or 12 hours, right? Or six hours for that matter. If you can accomplish everything that is in front of you to the best of your ability and push the ball a little bit further forward, then that's a good outcome, right? I think too many people who be are put in a position of power think that the best people around them are the ones that are going to sit into the office till nine o'clock at night. And there are times when that's necessary, but again, that doesn't necessarily make them the best people. Sometimes that just makes them the people who are hanging on and want to be seen, but are not necessarily putting out the best output. That's and right. I mean, for all you know, they could really be playing solitaire that. in their office, right? They could, they could be doing something other than supporting, supporting what you're trying to accomplish. So on that point, and I, I respect what you just said, I, I, I absolutely believe that you need to be your authentic self. And if your authentic self is someone that thrives on, on working a certain amount of time, then you should do that. Especially let's face it, entrepreneurs, generally speaking, work harder than almost anyone else. That's just how it goes. Uh, they, they live, breathe and sleep their business. Um, how do you communicate to people that the expectation is not that they match you hour for hour, that it is output related and not, you know, um, time related. Uh, with clear and honest communication, like that's it. You, and you know, people debate, well, what if they don't believe you? Well, if they don't believe you, then that's, that's an unfortunate that's on reality. Them. You can't control and what people do. You can, you can they, only tell them that they, they've got to choose to do something with it. And that's up to them. 
you got it. You you can't always convince everybody to think the way you think, right? Or convince them that what you're saying is the truth. They either believe you or they don't. If they they don't believe anything that you're saying, um, then you got to question: Is that person the right person? Or more importantly, that person should be questioning themselves: Is this the environment that I want to be in, where I think the the leader in front of me is lying to me all the time, right? Um, and the reality is just be clear with them. You know, I, I've had salespeople who come to me and said, well, you know, I'm, I'm trying, I'm putting in 12, 15 hours a day and I'll crystal clear. I don't care if you go for a walk. I don't care if you work four hours. The, the line in front of you, what you need to achieve is here. And if you can do that in four hours a day, good on you. That's the expectation. That's the compensation that you're getting is to achieve that, right? If you want more, then do more. Um, but sometimes just doing that is good enough. You know, I'll give you another example. Like I had a, a young individual who was uh, getting started in their career and they were about a year in to the company. They came to me and said, um, you know, I want to talk about my promotion. And they were many rungs under me officially in, in the chain, but I always kind of had an open door policy. I said, all right, sit down, I'll play ball. Let's talk. Tell me why you believe that you should be getting a promotion. And this individual said, well, I've been at the company for a year. I said, okay. And I thought for a second, I said, I'm confused. I'm like, did, did we not pay you? <laughs> and the person took a step back and said, well, and of course I got paid. That's why I came to work. Okay, so we, we paid you um, and compensated you for the work that you did. Yeah, but I want more. I'm like, but what? So I said, okay, again, I'll play ball. What more have you done? Well, I did my job. But now we're talking in circles. I, you got compensated for the job that you were doing. If you want more, then you have to do more. And the unfortunate reality of most things in the world, especially when it comes to business, is you have to do more first, right? Don't put your hand out first, do it. And having run a business of thousands of people, if I see someone that is already taking on the responsibility, who do you think I'm most likely to promote? Who do you think I'm most likely to give the next chance? Because I have hundreds of problems every day that I'm dealing with. If I say, hey, look, Tal's already taken it on, seems to be leading the team. He's doing a little bit extra. Perfect. Let's give Tal a shot. That is now one problem off my list and I can move on to the next one. But that, that's kind of how I think about it. You know, it's if you want more, you have to do more. Um, if you're content, then do what's put in front of you and understand that you know, it's up to you to manage your own time to figure out how that gets accomplished. Yeah, I, uh, I wholeheartedly agree. I, I want to go back to another point you made, and, and I, could, I could also very much relate to it. You said, you know, I, I have high expectations of people. Um, and let's face it, I'm sure you and I have both been in places where you have high expectations of people and they let you down. And um, the greatest challenge, I think, for a leader in those moments is to self-regulate. And I'll be the first to admit that earlier in my career, I was not very good at it. I mean, when people let me down, I, I, I would never lose my cool out of the gate. Maybe not even the second time and sometimes not the third. But if someone let me down uh, and I felt it was effort related or focus related I, or whatever, I, you know, I gave myself permission to behave badly. I gave myself permission to raise my voice. I gave myself permission to speak disrespectfully or unkindly. And it's one of the uh, one of my biggest regrets, and I don't have a lot of regrets because, for the most part, I am who I am because of the lessons I've had and the experiences I've had. How do you deal with people who let you down? What is I mean, first of all, has it evolved for you? Has it changed from where it was, say, ten years ago? Uh, and and how would you recommend if someone is you know listening and and has direct reports, whether they're a CEO or run a division um, or you know, working at McDonald's, what do you recommend to people when they're dealing with colleagues or subordinates who are letting them down? Yeah, you know, Tal, your, your story is probably not uncommon, I would say, to the vast majority of young leaders, right? Which is, you let me down, and now I'm, I'm the leader, I'm the authority. So I'm going to tell you why you let me down, and you need to do better, and I'm going to, I'm just going to, you know, make it your problem. I think, Mine has evolved because part of it is, yes, I have high expectation. Um, but the other is you need to be a little bit self-reflecting. Uh, self so when someone lets you down, 
part of it you need to understand is why did they let you down, right? Did they let you down because they frankly just didn't put in the level of effort or passion into what they were doing that they should have, right? Because that's one slice of the problem. And, and let me but put the, a word to what you're just describing. You're talking about curiosity. You're, you're saying start with being curious about what happened or why did it happen? Yeah, that's what it and sounds reflecting like. on it. Because if, if it's just a blatant, they didn't put in the level of effort, then that invokes one type of response. But in a lot of situations, what happens if you put them in a position of too much responsibility and they simply failed? What happens if you didn't train them properly or set them up for success and they failed? Is that that individual's fault or is that that individual's responsibility or is that yours? And you need to understand that. Now, if you empower somebody with everything they need, open door policy, I'm here to help. If you can't do it, come talk to me and let's work on it together. And they simply choose not to be bothered, then that's a different scenario. Um, but I think in a lot of cases, and the unfortunate reality is people aren't set up for success. And when you're a younger leader, um, you tend to not look at those things and say, well, that's not my problem. You should have done better. Um, and that's not really a fair judgment, I think, of a lot of people um, when you consider it whether they did what they needed to do or not. Yeah, I think excellent. I, I excellent point, and I I agree. And I think it is in fact a uh, it is not only a young leader's problem. It is the the the, the leader who is not mindful uh, can can continue to do that well into their careers. And you and I, I'm sure, have run into people, oftentimes very successful people. They never learned that lesson. Um, and for one reason or another, the, you know, fate has smiled on them and they've been successful despite it. Um, but I, you know, I look at that as, as one of the best lessons of my life is to recognize that uh, when someone lets me down, it doesn't give me the opportunity to disrespect them um, or be unkind. And if, if I can't uh, get someone to do the work the way I want them to, I want it done, or I feel like they're not performing, then there are, there are other avenues I can take, but the avenue of, uh, you know, causing them personal, um, you know, offense is not an avenue that I uh, choose to pursue at this point in my career. And I would urge whoever's listening to contemplate that if you're an offender uh, and you give yourself permission because you think, well, yeah, but they did X, Y, and Z, therefore I can, I would uh, urge you to consider whether that therefore I can part is actually legitimate or just, you know, maybe the, 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 some unresolved issues, maybe from childhood that, you, that you're still dealing with. Um, let's yeah. pivot. I want to talk to you. I want to, oh, by, by all means, if you have anything to comment on that. Be, nope, go ahead. Guess. Uh, I want to pivot to, uh, to, to the fact that you had the unique experience with uh, a Vigilon uh, to lead the company through a very significant transaction that had to have been very exciting. And also, um, you know, probably you had moments of uh, moments of, of feeling uh, some doubts or uh, uncertainty about whether things will will happen. You and I, I'm sure, have both been on on deals where you 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 get very close and you think you're going to get something done and then it doesn't happen. Talk to us about what it feels like to 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 push a deal that big through. I mean, a billion dollar deal is not is not something that everybody can can say they've been a part of. No, I, I was fortunate enough to be part of it, um, and it was it was an experience, Tal. Um, you know the the reality of that particular experience was it was a public company. Um, so that brings a whole new dimension to dealing with a transaction because now you have um, the potential acquiring party, right? You have the bankers or whoever else is involved. You have your board that you're dealing with and you also have shareholders and you need to navigate all of those pieces um, and steer them all into a place where they're happy. Good. So let's let's backtrack on that then. You really need yeah. to navigate all of those pieces into a place where everybody feels like they're getting a win out of proceeding with the transaction. Um, and the interesting dimension about it is you can't stop running the business while you're doing that, right? So I'm a public company. I have to report every three months. And if there's a dip in our success, obviously it has one more dimension to impacting the transaction so it, it ended up with you know going back to how we started this conversation a whole lot of work um, you're effectively running a major public company 
Um, you're working another full-time job, which is exploring the transaction. Um, and then you're spending your evenings on calls with the board and major shareholders and everybody else who you're talking to. Now, ultimately for that particular transaction, because we were public, um, I was probably more appropriately the steward because um, it's ultimately the board and the shareholders decision whether they want to proceed or not. Um, but I kind of had to corral all the pieces and make sure everyone understood the ins and outs of it and give them what they needed to be able to make an informed decision. But it was, uh, it was an incredible experience. Um, it was a lot of work. Yeah, <laughs> a I've, lot of work. I've been through some big transactions and they are a lot of work. So let's talk about Mindsy. You have a, uh, you have an exciting idea. You, you're, you're, you believe the democratizing process mining is uh is where it's at tell us first of all what it even means and what are you trying to accomplish with mindsy yeah so i'll take a step back how we got here um in our my last business we were growing really quickly and one of the challenges that we faced is that frankly our own internal processes just weren't keeping up processing sales orders all, all this all the back end stuff because we were growing so quickly um and frankly we just didn't spend enough time and attention on them and the solution was always, we need more people, we need more money. We need more people, we need more money. Um, and it got me to the point of saying, well, wait a minute, what have we done to make this area of the business better? Uh, and what I ended up doing is I created a small department within the organization that, funny enough, I called business process improvement. And we just sick them on a different department every single quarter. And I said, I don't want to know the 30,000 foot. I want to know the first button we click to the last thing we do, dissect it, present it to me in the boardroom, and then we're going to sit down and figure out as a team, how do we make it better? It, you know, use a marketing term, it was truly transformational. It was amazing when you really dug under the hood um, and took the time to fully understand how an area of the business truly operated, the amount of insights and opportunities that were in there. So fast forward, when I exited that business, it really got me down the path of there are others in my same position who I had spoken with. How do you solve this problem leveraging technology? And that's how I discovered a concept known as process mining. And the best way to think about it really the business that we're in is, is process intelligence. It's taking the idea of business intelligence, where you get reports and everything else about your business and really turning it on its head. So instead of thinking about your business as a static report, we have this many sales orders, this many outstanding receivables, you're now starting to understand your business as a workflow, a number of things that have to happen in order to accomplish a task. What process mining does is connects into the systems that run businesses, you know, SAP, Microsoft, Oracle, NetSuite, um, and transforms the digital traces, data that people never would look at before, into visual representative visual representations of how a business works. And now what they do is for the first time, they get data-driven transparency. Here's how your accounts payable works. Here's your order to cash process. Here's your procurement process. Here's your customer support ticket process. And in that transparency, there is just a treasure trove of opportunity. Duplicate paid invoices, um, constant corrections and rework that can be fixed, uh, understanding delays and payments, being able to improve working capital, all these just, it's like a pot of gold for organizations. So, so is um, Mindsy a, an AI version of auditing? I mean, it sounds that way. It sounds like you're, you're talking about what used to require, you know, people with pocket protectors. Is that what yeah, you're talking it's, about? It, we do leverage AI for a fair bit of it, but think of it more as um, an X-ray for a business. So mm -hmm. you're now getting the level of insight that you can't get out of a traditional report or business intelligence tool. And you understand what the steps are to do things, where the bottlenecks are, what's causing that bottlenecks and effectively you can make it more efficient. So a great example, one of our customers plugged in our process intelligence tool and they were able to increase their sales order processing by 30%. So when you talk about a multi-billion dollar organization, the impact on their working capital is staggering, right? Because you're talking about taking days and weeks off that order to cash cycle. And that's what executives are craving. And, and frankly, Tal, I, I fell backwards into it from my own experience. And that's kind of what drove me to launch Mindsy. So if you're not doing Mindsy, what are you doing? So what if, if I'm a, you know, a, a, an operator of a business, I, it sounds like you're 
probably, uh, you know, let me not, let me be curious. Are, are you primarily targeting big businesses? Who are your clients? So we target mid enterprise and up because it's really okay. around driving efficiency and operational excellence. Um, if they're not doing MindZ, they're doing one-off consulting projects. Now we do work with a bunch of the consulting firms. And the reason we work with them is because now they're able to tra provide data-driven transparency. So mm -hmm. when they make a change and suggest a way to improve a process within an organization, we can say initial state, mid-state, ending state, and continue to monitor moving forward. So if they're not doing Mindsy and looking at process intelligence, most aren't doing anything. Um, this is a relatively new category that's just really starting to explode, known as process mining and process intelligence. Um, and it's something that businesses are now just starting to realize that, hey, this is possible, right? We have this data already. And with the right software platform, we can uncover all these secrets. Um, so it's a really, it, it's a very interesting um, space to be in right now. And from personal experience, you know, I've seen it firsthand what can be done. And I didn't even have a data driven tool at the time. How hard is it? To, how hard is it to integrate Mindsy? If I'm, if I'm working with an Oracle or, or, or Salesforce or any of the many platforms out there that large businesses, generally speaking, are plugged into, and they usually also have a variety of other systems that they're deploying. How, how much time and how much effort does it take to get Mindsy to be ready to provide, you know, valuable information back to the business? Yeah. So one of our claims to fame is we're up and running quite quickly. So I've, we have pre-built connectors for all the major systems. So we can turn on and be running very, very quickly for a business with pre-packaged templates and insights. So it's, in, you know, it's days or a couple of weeks max before they're up and running and be able to take advantage of it. Um, so the onboarding can be quite quick uh, mm -hmm. from that perspective. So, I mean, MindZ sounds like a, you know, an innovative business on the cutting edge. Uh, and whenever you're in in an innovative business on the cutting edge, you make certain assumptions about the market, about how the market will respond. In my experience, those assumptions are almost never exactly right. And oftentimes they're quite wrong. doesn't mean you don't have a business. It sometimes just means it's not the business you thought you're going to have. Yeah. What can you talk to me about assumptions and how, first of all, how do you challenge your own assumptions and uh, how do you respond when, when the market's telling you, well, you know what? With all due respect, James, we think it's going to be X, not Y. Yeah, you know, it's it. Irrespective of your experience, you're 100 right, Tal. That it's it's fraught with challenges. Um, and really, when you launch a business, uh, you're coming up with a thesis, and people say, "Ah, but I have a business plan." No, you don't you have a thesis. You've written it down on paper and you call it a business plan, but you don't know that that is true to your point because you haven't proven it. So you start off with this thesis of this is what I think the market is, this is the opportunity, and this is how I'm going to solve that problem. Um, for me, it's about constantly challenging your own assumptions. And I want to be crystal clear for your listeners when I say that, that is not mean pivoting. Because if you are pivoting, you're going left, you're going right, you're going left, you're going right, you're going up, you're going down. What you're doing is a giant circle over and over again, wearing a hole in the ground and you're not making progress anywhere. It is vastly different from what I like to think of as challenging your assumptions. Because at every stage, you're going to face, like we talked about, those challenges, right? Those massive hurdles, those gut-wrenching losses. And they're going to make you sit back and say, you know what, I made a giant mistake. We, we picked the market wrong. We chose the wrong product. We can't beat the number one competitor, whatever that might be. Um, but the, re the reality is you really need to challenge and just reaffirm the assumptions that you made. And sometimes that's as simple as constantly communicating that to people. Well, why? What is it you do? Why does that matter? And if you can't articulate that, um, then you really need to think about your assumptions. If you can't articulate who's your customer, and I don't mean, hey, we're going to go after large enterprises. That's great. There's 50,000 people in those companies. Who are you going after and why does it matter to them? What's the profile? What's the fit? Um, and constantly challenging those assumptions and forcing yourself to reaffirm that you're on the right path. Now, sometimes that means you got to bump a little bit here and there, um, but generally you want to constantly reaffirm that you're on a path towards success and that the assumptions that you made are accurate and keep testing them. Never assume, even if you get some early success, even if you 
you land a bunch of customers, like we're off to a great start. We've got Fortune 500 businesses and all kinds of things. That doesn't necessarily mean that all the assumptions that we've made are correct. So they still need to be reevaluated and and challenged as the business continues to grow. Yeah, I would I agree, and I also think that it's important that you make it safe for people who report to you and work with you to know that if even if an assumption was yours, even if a strategy was yours, if it's not the right strategy, they need to speak their minds and know that it's safe, that they're not going to be judged harshly for uh, speaking truth. Um, in some organizations and with some leaders, that's, that's not easy. So making it easy on your team, on your colleagues, on your subordinates to speak truth to you, uh, is a really big part of being able to take something in a, you know, like what you're doing in a, in in a new kind of idea and a new kind of, uh, a new kind of way of going after something. Um, inevitably there's going to need to be some modifications to the strategy and that takes, that takes a village. You know, I tell that statement is probably something that your listeners should be writing down because the the other problem that I have with businesses, when you look at these wildly successful leaders, and we could name all of them the biggest companies in the world right now, I pers- and I'm going to quantify this with personal opinion, is that people look at it and say, well, that's because they're a genius. They came up with everything, right? They set all the directions. They said, um, and this is the only cuss word I will use on your on your podcast, but that's <laughs> bullshit, right? I've led a public company. Did I make all the exact dis- right decisions that got the business to where they are today? No, they came from a multitude of different people. And the reality is most leaders just refuse to admit that. So we, we you know, um, set these large company leaders on a pedestal like they have some type of oracle crystal ball that no one else has and they've made all these perfect decisions and that is absolutely not the reality the reality if you really uncover a lot of those organizations the decisions came from all kinds of individuals at different levels within those organizations and yes maybe the ceo either encouraged the decisions to come up maybe they picked that as the bet they were going to make yes but it's not that they made all those decisions so leveraging the team that you've built and encouraging them to understand that this is the thesis. This is what I believe. I believe we need to do this, 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 this. But if you see something in the field, put your hand up and say, I don't think that's correct. And here's why. And let's talk about it as a team. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, 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 you and I are in violent agreement here. And I think the, uh, the most important thing a CEO can do is create the culture that allows, you know, people to think, uh, without feeling constrained and without feeling uh, potentially at risk for their careers or their livelihood because they challenge the leader or challenge groupthink. Um, and I often, you know, in, in my career, um, have championed people that, you know, were two or three levels removed from senior leadership and gave them opportunities because they showed that kind of courage. And when you, and when you recognize and reward and promote people in your company for having courage, you set the tone uh, for, for what, what, what you're expecting. And people, people respond to that, especially people that frankly are predisposed to respond to that. Um, and those are the people you want. Um, I want to finish with, uh, you know, with a, a little lightly, um, you know, you, you talked about um, that one of the most important roles of a, of a leader and a CEO is to be the company's biggest cheerleader. And uh, no offense, I would not want to see you in a cheerleading outfit. Uh, you're a lovely guy. Um, but talk to me about the fine line between being a cheerleader and being fake. Uh, how do you how do you remain genuine uh, as a cheerleader? Passion, in a word. You have to be able to put forth and express your passion and belief in what you're doing. If you don't express that passion, it comes out, oh no, it's, it's going to be fine. Who cares? That, that, that block didn't matter. It doesn't matter. Let's just keep going, right? But you have to be able to convey your passion for what you're doing and rally your team behind that. Because you also have to understand that the resiliency that you may have in your own mental fortitude may not necessarily resonate with all of your team. 
So some of those challenges that occur that they get exposed to may set them back a little further than they might set you back. But what they're going to do is they're going to turn to how you handle that situation. I put it akin to um, I've traveled more air miles than I like to uh, admit to. I still hate flying and I hate turbulence. But one of the things you'll see on a flight is the flight attendants don't blink. Now, that plane can be bouncing all over the place. They're just grabbing the chairs, walking up and down the aisle with a smile on their face still. If that flight attendant panics, how do you think the rest of the people on that plane will react? And that's probably the best analogy that I could give you in terms of how do you stay genuine, show your passion, and understand that your team is watching for how you react. You hang your head and say, oh, we're defeated. What do you think the team who is potentially less resilient than you, not meaning that in a bad way or by any means, how do you think they are going to walk away from that meeting or that thing that just happened? Our guest today was Jim. He is a extreme, some very cool thing and is running a company that I think and uh, it's been incredible. I think you've been uh, very transparent and forthcoming, and I believe a lot of our guests will, uh, will 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 learn a lot from what you what you said and how you said it. So I want to thank you for being my guest. Um, I want to wish you continued success. And um, you know, if anyone needs to reach you or wants to reach you, how could they do that? Uh, probably the best bet is go check us out at our website www.mindsy.com. I'm also on LinkedIn, so look me up and and always to help. Um, are always happy to help wherever I can guide someone along the way. It's kind of my little bit of giving back. But Tal, thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Take care, James. Thanks.